that we walk around with our guard up all the time. And there are so few spaces where we feel like we can let our guard down. And the Harry Potter fandom is one of those places. And then JK Rowling comes in and takes that away from us. JK Rowling is one of the most successful writers of all time. Yet her controversial tweets about gender have left fans wondering if she has tarnished her entire legacy. The British writer, known primarily for her massively successful Harry Potter books, is the best selling book series author of all time. Her status as beloved children's writer has sadly been tarnished, though, by her problematic views of gender, and specifically transgender voices in feminist spaces. Proclaiming to be a feminist herself, Rowling has made it difficult for a lot of her former fans to continue supporting her due to her regressive views on intersectionality. Sadly, she seems to want to overshadow her entire career by continuing to defend her opinions and more recently double down on her stance. Today we're covering controversial author JK Rowling. Tomorrow though, I'd love for you to decide. Please comment down below who you'd like us to cover on the next episode of Where Are They Now? And don't forget to like this video for more content. Born in England, Joanne Rowling lived a rags to riches life. She lived off of food stamps in her early life. During a childhood that she describes as unhappy due to her mother's multiple sclerosis diagnosis and her strained relationship with her father. She was described by teachers as average and taking no particular interest in any of her classes. When she graduated from high school and then university, Rowling worked as a researcher and secretary in London for Amnesty International. While on a four hour delayed train ride from Manchester to London, the initial ideas for Harry Potter began forming. While she was writing the first book, Rowling's mother unfortunately succumbed to MS. The grief that the author experienced in the wake of her mother's death were channeled into her character, Harry Potter's own feelings of losing his family. While writing her novel, Joanne met and married a man from Portugal who openly admits to slapping her in a Sun article that was later removed for promoting domestic violence. In the wake of her victimization, Rowling fled Portugal for Scotland where she remained in abject poverty, living off of food stamps with her baby girl. When setting out to publish her first book, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, 12 different publishing companies denied her manuscript before she was finally given the green light by a small company in London. The decision to publish Rowling's book was largely in part to the 8 year old daughter of the publisher who, upon given the first chapter to read by her father, immediately demanded more. The book went on to win quite a few children's literary prizes. Scholastic Inc. bought the rest of the novel and redistributed it under the title Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone in America. By the release of her fourth book, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, JK was an established children's author who broke record sales in both the UK and the US every single time she released a new installment in her series. By the year 2000, Rowling was awarded the title of Author of the Year in the British Book Awards. Her final Harry Potter book, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows, broke all of its predecessors' records and became the fastest selling book of all time, selling 11 million copies in the first day of its release. During her writing of the books, Warner Bros. signed a movie deal and purchased the filming rights for the first two novels. The only way that JK would sign the rights for the movie deal, however, were if she had a large part in the creation of the script, if the entire cast were British, and if Coca-Cola, the company who agreed to support the creation of the films, donated 18 million US dollars to the Reading is Fundamental charity. With those stipulations agreed to, the movies were filmed and met with massive success. Rowling is currently still working with Warner Bros for her movies based on a different character set in the same universe that follows events occurring 70 years before the main series. The next film, Fantastic Beasts The Secrets of Dumbledore, is scheduled to be released in early 2022. In 2004, Forbes said that JK Rowling was the first person to become a US dollar billionaire by writing books. After spending eight years on the list of billionaires, Rowling was taken off in 2012 because she gave so much money away to charity that it denounced her status as billionaire to millionaire. She was the world's highest paid author in 2017 and 2019. While the author is certainly more well known for her Harry Potter series, she has also gained quite the reputation as a philanthropist. She frequently donates tons of money to various charities, namely ones involving and encouraging children to read, anti-poverty, multiple sclerosis awareness, and more recently combating COVID-19. Rowling is also an advocate for liberal ideals, being a vocal supporter of the labor movement in the UK and liberal candidates in US elections. She's also certainly not stayed silent about her views on religion and gay marriage. While plenty of religious groups have condemned her books for their perceived promotion of witchcraft, Rowling identifies as a Christian. She responds with laughter and humor to the angry outcry at her books, with the viewpoint that it's tedious to be angry about there being wizards in a fiction book when there's so much else to focus on. She also routinely defends gay marriage. In 2015, when Ireland finally legalized same-sex marriage, Rowling joked that finally Dumbledore and Gandalf could get married. When a far-right church group responded with ire, she said, quote, Alas, the sheer awesomeness of such a union in such a place would blow your tiny bigoted minds out of your thick slopping skulls. So with all this in mind, pray tell me why she, of all people, is being accused of transphobia. Well, in December 2019, JK Rowling came out in support of a researcher who lost 
lost her job because she believed that quote, men cannot change into women. The author tweeted out her support by saying quote, dress however you please, call yourself whatever you like, sleep with any consenting adult who will have you, live your best life in peace and security, but force women out of their jobs for stating that sex is real? Fans of the author were outraged by her comments. There were also previous transphobic incidences that Rowling had engaged in, namely calling trans women men in dresses and snarkily disagreeing with inclusive language regarding menstruation. And thus, JK Rowling has been labeled a TERF, which is an acronym for the term trans exclusionary radical feminist, or namely someone who says they support women despite disagreeing with trans rights. To this day, JK has defended her stance and thinks any backlash made against her is quote, women hate. Reactions to these comments were swift with actors involved in the Harry Potter series being quick to denounce her actions. Daniel Radcliffe, the actor who starred in the movies, shared a statement saying that quote, transgender women are women. Any statements to the contrary erase the identity and dignity of transgender people and goes against all advice given by professional healthcare associates who have far more expertise on this subject matter than either Joe or I. To all the people who now feel that their experience of the book has been tarnished or diminished, I'm deeply sorry for the pain these comments have caused you. Fans of Rowling are equally upset, with many unsure if they're still even allowed to love the books for fear it supports the author's hateful opinions. One Twitter user eloquently states, quote, JK Rowling has basically become Dolores Umbridge, so obsessed with her deeply prejudiced perspective that she'll go to any length to remain convinced of her own righteousness, no matter what harm it causes. Even still, in the wake of her newly premiered trailer for a movie coming out in just a few months, Rowling is making transphobic comments on Twitter. What I don't understand is why she can't just leave it alone. Every time you post hateful vitriol towards a marginalized group, you only serve to further alienate yourself from the people who loved and adored you as children. Can't you just like stop talking about it? Even if your views remain the same, your continual need to hurt the people who love you makes it all the more confusing. It's almost like she's been so insanely rich for so long that she doesn't know how to have true empathy anymore. The amount of bravery it takes just to be a normal trans person living your life is insurmountable. And if some author holds up in their multi-million dollar mansion and validates your very existence, that'd make me feel so awful too. With the release of her new movie, plenty of people have begun to question if it's even ethical to keep supporting the author. Despite her overcoming poverty, domestic violence, and constant rejection to change the literary world forever, her recent remarks on transgender people have made it all seem kind of tainted. She's tarnishing her books, books that tell a story of an underdog kid who goes on to prove that anyone can do the right thing, and fans just seem pretty heartbroken by it. Whether or not one decides to go see the movie is, I think, a deeply personal one, but in an increasingly ethically driven consumer culture, a lot of people feel that they aren't allowed to support the series. An article in the Globe and Mail puts it beautifully, stating, quote, let's be real, whether you read Harry Potter is largely irrelevant if you're not also taking action against homophobia and transphobia in your day-to-day -day life. It then goes on to say that the fans who have created stories of their own around the world of Hogwarts have, quote, imbued the books with meaning and made them into the cultural behemoth that it is today. And nothing JK says can change that. Did you have a good look at her face during that conversation? Yes. Amber Heard's name seems much more synonymous with the case she's been embroiled in with her ex Johnny Depp than she does with the movie she's in. As I write this script, the live stream of the trial between Amber and Johnny is currently underway. Text messages were revealed between the former lovers that show just how toxic and violent the relationship got, with cops being called and extremely harsh words being spoken between one another. Celebrities have also been called to testify, including actors like Jason Momoa and people like Elon Musk. Just a warning, I am going to remain relatively impartial during this whole thing to show just facts rather than diluting it with my own opinion on the whole thing. So let's catch up with just how the trial is going between Amber Heard and Johnny Depp. Today we're covering Amber Heard. Tomorrow though, you decide. Let us know in the comments down below who you think we should cover on the next episode of Where Are They Now? And don't forget to hit the like button for more content just like this. Let's get into it. Amber Heard was born in Austin, Texas, to a very outdoorsy family that would routinely horseback ride, fish, and hunt. Amber herself was very involved in the scene and raised stoutly Catholic throughout her childhood. However, when she was a teenager, Heard began identifying as an atheist after her best friend passed tragically in a car crash. A year after the tragedy that left Amber in shambles, she stated that she, quote, no longer felt comfortable in conservative, God-fearing Texas, and decided to move to Los Angeles to pursue acting while earning her high school diploma through a home study course. In her mid-teens, living in LA by herself, Amber began her work in acting straight away. She started appearing in small television and music video roles in the early 2000s. 
A few years into her career, she began receiving leading roles in C-list slasher movies and teen dramas. Her first big break came about in 2008, when she obtained a role in the cult classic comedy Pineapple Express. She went on to star in much higher profile films alongside actors like Nicolas Cage and Demi Moore. In 2017, Heard landed a role in the movie Justice League as Aquaman's love interest. And up until now, she was set to appear in the next installment of the film, set to be released near the end of 2022, but more on that later. Amber Heard was embroiled in 2014 in a mass celebrity lewd photo leak where several celebrities had their private photos distributed without their consent. Being a victim of having private images leaked has led Amber to write an op-ed about feeling taken advantage of during the digital age and how easy it is for predators to access your information. Now, let's get into the controversy that has Amber almost completely consumed. Back in 2011, she first met Johnny Depp on the set of a movie. The pair began dating near the end of 2011, beginning of 2012. This came on the coattails of Depp's separation from his partner of 14 years. Before we fully get into their relationship, it is worth noting that Amber had been arrested back in 2009 for harming her then girlfriend in Washington, wherein it was alleged that she aggressively grabbed and hit her girlfriend. All the charges were dropped, however, with the alleged victim herself stating that it was blown way out of proportion. Anyways, back to the Depp Bird romance. The pair got engaged in 2014 and ended up getting married a year later. Their relationship would only last until mid-2016, however, when Heard officially files for divorce from Johnny and accuses him of physically harming her. She claimed that he hurt her when he was under the influence of substances. My language here has to be careful because of you two, just so you know. She further says that he threw his phone at her and left her with a bruised face. However, the cops released a report stating that when they showed up to the couple's home on the call of harm, they found that no crime had actually taken place. Johnny Depp, meanwhile, vehemently denied these accusations and accused Amber of, quote, attempting to secure a premature financial resolution by alleging harm. Initially, when the case was just beginning, a $7 million settlement was agreed upon outside of court, where Depp paid Heard the money and they both released a joint statement stating that, quote, our relationship was intensely passionate and at times volatile, but always bound by love. Neither party has made false accusations for financial gain. So it seems like they both freely admitted that Johnny Depp hurt Amber Heard, and Hollywood would react accordingly. In the midst of holding high profile individuals accountable for their actions, Depp was basically blacklisted from work for quite some time. He was dropped from movies and no one was going to hire him. In 2018, a year after their divorce was finalized, Amber wrote a Washington Post op-ed about the treatment of women in domestic harm cases. Despite never naming Johnny himself, it's pretty clear who the article was aimed towards. Due to this article, Depp sued her for $50 million, accusing her of defamation of character and basically lying in her piece. In the lawsuit, Depp accuses her of lying about being hurt by Johnny, and instead he claims that she hurt him. In a court filing that attempted to cancel the charges, her details multiple instances of harm and even refers to Johnny Depp as a monster. The pair continue to throw accusations at one another, with Depp claiming that the actress cheated on him with James Franco and Elon Musk, and Heard claimed she still has scars on her arms from when her ex allegedly dragged her through broken glass. All this seems pretty confusing, and a lot of he said, she said. That was until in 2020 when phone recordings were released in which Heard admits to hitting Johnny Depp. In the recording, she says, quote, I'm sorry that I hit you across the face in a proper slap, but I wasn't hitting you. It was not punching you. Babe, you're not punched. The conversation then continues with Depp claiming he left because he didn't want their fight to get uglier and Heard replying, quote, I can't promise you I won't get physical again. God, I sometimes I get so mad I lose it. This is the most solid damning evidence to date that the public has been made aware of that would officially prove that Amber was the one committing harm rather than the other way around. During the lawsuits, two of Johnny Depp's former relationships, including the 14 year one he had prior to Amber, both claimed that Johnny had never hurt them nor made any indication of him hurting anyone. One ex-partner stated, quote, the idea that he is an incredibly violent person is the furthest thing from the Johnny I know and loved. I cannot wrap my head around these accusations. As of right now, Johnny Depp has been denied two separate times an appeal of the court's ruling that he had harmed Amber, despite all the evidence against her. 
His defense lawyer has this to say about the ruling. Quote, most troubling is the judge's reliance on the testimony of Amber Heard and corresponding disregard of the mountain of counter evidence from police officers, medical practitioners, her own former assistant, other unchallenged witnesses, and an array of documentary evidence which completely undermines the allegations point by point. Despite the legal ruling that completely sides with Amber Heard, which resulted in Johnny Depp being asked to step down from his role in the Harry Potter spin-off, Fantastic Beasts, the public has very clearly sided with Depp. The legal fight definitely is not over though. As it stands now, Johnny is suing Amber for defamation, claiming that her allegations against him are false and constitute mischaracterization. The results of this trial could finally turn the case in Depp's favor. While the public is very clearly sided with him, so far the court has been completely obstinate. What we know right now of the cases that are currently in progress is that more and more texts are being revealed in court with just how violent things got. They're recounting testimonies, and Johnny is claiming that Amber's false accusation led him to lose movie roles and made it difficult for him to supplement his income. It seems like based on the evidence, both parties have been extremely harmful to one another. They both instigated fights and egged each other on, where harm became common and expected. At the end of the day, it seems like a genuinely toxic space, but very obviously, Amber has been let off with a much easier sentence. She retains movie roles. Well, until now. Following the verdict that denies Depp's defamation lawsuit, a change.org petition was started that demanded Heard be fired from her newest movie, Aquaman 2. The petition reached 2 million people who signed it and, in January, it was confirmed by the director of the film that she had indeed been released from filming and would not appear in the latest installment. Only time will tell just how messy this will continue to be. And as it stands with the trial in progress, I wish I had more information than I do, but it's just not available. Stop this show! Stop this show! Currently being sued for $750 million, rapper and music producer Travis Scott has been on the constant rise in the rap world. With a net worth of $60 million, that's definitely at risk after the Astroworld Festival tragedy. Travis Scott has been in the spotlight since he stepped on the scene. He gained multiple sponsorships and even partnerships with companies like Nike and McDonald's. He made the Forbes 30 under 30 list last year in 2020. Scott also produced a live concert within the game Fortnite and has a Netflix documentary, Look Mom, I Can Fly. Managing his way into the Kardashian empire, Scott is famously dating Kylie Jenner and became father to baby Stormy. Though I'm pretty sure those days are officially over. After the tragic losses of concert goers from Astroworld Festival, similar incidences at his previous shows, I think it's safe to say that Travis Scott is no longer on top and has a lot of work ahead of him. His career could even be finished. Hi friends, it's Emily, and you're watching Where Are They Now? And this is Travis Scott. Travis started his career in the early 2010s by signing with the one and only Kanye. He also met Scott Muscutty, aka Kid Cudi, who became his mentor and influenced part of Travis Scott's stage name. As his career grew, Scott started his own record label Cactus Jack. He's worked alongside many famous artists and even produced Rihanna's song Better Have My Money. Travis Scott landed a huge deal with Nike and designed specialty Cactus Jack Air Force Ones. If you can find any now, they'll be at least at 400% markup from original retail value, which was around $200. He met Kylie Jenner at Coachella back in 2017 and wanted to be in her world. Well, more like the Kardashian Jenner world ever since. His mentor Kanye was married to Kim, so it made sense. After beginning his relationship with Kylie Jenner and the birth of Stormy, Scott's fame kept growing. Travis Scott also pulled off a live show within the game Fortnite that drew in 12 million viewers. And after the release of his Netflix documentary, Look Mom, I Can Fly, his career and fan base continued to rise even more. Travis Scott became so influential and powerful, but 
There seems to be a trend of violence that either comes out at these events or is enticed by the performers. Now facing a $750 million lawsuit for the Astro World Festival, Travis Scott is probably one of the most hated people on the planet. Now we all get excited seeing our favorite artists and bands perform. And if you've ever been to any live show, then you know the feeling I'm talking about. It's usually happiness and joy, but for some reason at Astro World it was dark and life threatening. Some news articles stated that festival goers had a bad feeling even before getting through the entrance. 10 deaths have been reported and the lawsuits are targeting Scott, the event's promoters, and management, Epic Records, Apple Music, and Live Nation for their failing to implement proper security and emergency response measures. Though they have been assisting local authorities with their investigations, including providing information and sharing any CCT footage, the future is looking a little rocky for some of these companies. And this isn't the first time that there have been lawsuits towards Travis Scott for encouraging fans to misbehave, jump barriers, and of course, rush the stage at his shows. The current suit also states that Scott has a history of enticing rowdiness during his shows and includes screenshots of his social media posts over the years in which he showed the bloodied and passed out fans. Ugh. In 2017, Scott was charged with inciting a riot, disorderly conduct, and endangering the welfare of a minor after encouraging concert goers to rush the stage in Arkansas, injuring a security guard, a police officer, and several others. He pleaded guilty to disorderly conduct, and the other charges were dropped. After the Astro World Festival, Houston's fire chief said, quote, the crowd began to compress towards the front of the stage, and that caused some panic, and it started causing some injuries. People began to fall out, become unconscious, and it created additional panic. Travis has since promised to cover the funeral expenses for the concert goers who have died, and announced a partnership with the online therapy provider BetterHelp, which will see the company offer one month of free therapy for anyone who is impacted by Friday's events. Personally, I've seen the videos that have been circling around and I'm pretty sure that one month of therapy isn't going to cut it. It's a wonderful start, but I believe it's time to implement actual punishment for the artist and see a real change with the negative impacts he's had on the music industry. Since the tragic festival, Scott has been hit with multiple lawsuits from attendees and the families of those deceased. It has been estimated that the number of lawsuits is in the hundreds. Scott, Live Nation, and concert promoter Scoremore are also named in another suit seeking $1 million in damages for one of the victims. Even Drake might be facing charges. I wouldn't be surprised if Travis Scott files for bankruptcy after the amount of lawsuits he's getting. I mean, even Kylie is over it. She, Stormy, and New Baby on the Way are safely in LA right now. Scott could even end up in jail. And who knows for how long? But one thing I can guarantee is that Scott is pulling out of festivals before he's booted out by the venues themselves. His career is most likely over as no venues are going to want to be associated with him and his brand ever again. As for where is he now? It seems in the upcoming months he could be facing some criminal charges, and at the very least, he will be spending a lot of time in courtrooms. I've put myself in a lot of situations where I've needed to apologize for my past actions, and I've never done this correctly, and I've never done this respectfully. David Dobrik is one of the most controversial people on YouTube. From beloved boy next door Vine star with a quirky and lovable attitude, to a man desperate for a comeback from scandals of unwanted advances, coercion, and bullying all in the name of content, David's career will never be the same. Many have even called for legal action against the content creator and his friends as the story spread from podcast topic to national news coverage. Will David ever recover his internet celebrity status, or is he doomed to pick up the pieces of his career left by his controversies? Let us know who you guys would like to see next, and please don't forget to hit the like button if you want more. David began his life in Slovakia, wherein he lived until his family moved to Illinois when he was only six years old. He began his media career on Vine in 2013 while in his senior year of high school, creating funny photos and collaborating frequently with other Vine stars like Liza Koshy, Gabby Hanna, and Jason Nash 
Dobrik built up a large enough following that he created a YouTube account in 2013. In this account, Dobrik posts longer form videos and vlogs with his tight knit group of friends known online as the Vlog Squad. These weekly videos document David driving his chaotic friends around Hollywood, pulling pranks, wreaking havoc, and having tons of fun while we sit at home and watch. And they are a massive hit, achieving millions of views per video. David's goofy and lovable personality propelled him quickly to YouTube stardom, where he hosts frequent ad sponsorships and boosts about his increasingly lavish lifestyle. Dubbed Gen Z's Jimmy Fallon, YouTube's golden boy would create frequent popular videos with the vlog squad, pranking different members of the group and running amok with their fancy cars provided to them by David's successful sponsorships. This love affair with fame didn't last forever though, as David's pranks increased with their riskiness. One day things just went a little bit too far. To set the scene, it's June in 2017. Dobrik films a Vlog Squad video entitled, He Thought He Was Kissing Her Super Cringy. In this video, Dobrik pranks a Vlog Squad member named Seth Francois by blindfolding him and having him kiss Jason Nash, another Vlog Squad member, while thinking it was Instagram model Karina Koff. The now deleted video paints an uncomfortable picture of non-consensual intimacy and became the first of many instances of David actually harming the people around him in the name of content. When the video was first posted, it didn't receive much backlash, but it wasn't until he created the environment that endangered innocent young girls that this particular video would come back to haunt him. The video in question, which has now since been deleted, is titled, She Should Not Have Played With Fire. David is hanging out with his friends, one of whom, Dom Zaglaitis, known online as Dirty Dom, invites a group of girls over for a party. Some of the women invited have intercourse with Dom, and it was later revealed that another Vlog Squad member may have bought alcohol for the girls who were under the legal drinking age at the time. Fast forward to February of 2021, Seth Francois, the Vlog Squad member who was tricked into kissing Jason Nash, posts a video on YouTube detailing the incident. Quote, I honestly didn't realize how much that situation affected me until the beginning of last year. I felt like that shouldn't have happened to me. Francois describes calling a hotline about the incident and speaking with someone, breaking down when he fully realizes the gravity of what was forced onto him. On top of all this, Francois also accuses Dobrik and his friends of racism, offering him watermelon and labeling him as quote, their only black friend. David's lack of sincere apology didn't sit right with a lot of his fans, who started to call him out for a silence, especially in the face of such serious accusations. And thus the unraveling of the vlog squad would begin, with other members coming under fire, namely Jason Nash, ex-boyfriend of former Frenemies podcaster Trisha Paytas. She claimed that David hid in a hotel room while Jason and Trisha were being intimate and filmed her naked without her consent. While Jason was aware of this so-called prank, Trisha was not. She asked David not to post a video titled, snuck into their hotel room and then in brackets, surprise. Yet the video currently has more than 14 million views and was only very recently privated. Trisha describes this instance on frenemies as humiliating and creating lasting mental health effects. The final proverbial nail in the coffin occurred in March 2021 when a woman from the previously mentioned five some video accuses Dom of forcing himself onto her while she was intoxicated and could not consent. In an article posted by Insider that blasts wide open the secrets of David and the vlog squad, Trisha Paytas describes being present before the interaction went down, stating that she left because of the underage drinking which felt quote insane to her. Paytas also said quote the women made it clear they did not want to have group with Seglitis. Hannah, one of the women involved in the situation, describes the events as she was being quote, guided through the door and she said she turned around quickly and told them that she wanted to go back to where her friends were, but Dirty Dom asked if they could hook up. She replied no. Dom would continue pressuring Hannah until she gave in. During the video, multiple vlog squad members also peeked into the door to watch, including David, who confirmed this in an interview clip. Jeff Wittick, another vlog squad member, was the one accused of bringing the alcohol to the party, which he denies at first. His attempt to clear his name is pathetic, and his denial of being on site when the sexual misconduct occurs is immediately rejected by a timestamp photo surfacing of Wittick, Dobrik, and another vlog squad member holding up an intoxicated young woman hours after Wittick claims to have left. It wasn't until the Insider Report was published that David finally addressed the controversies. In a 2 minute and 30 second video titled Let's Talk, Dobrik claims responsibility for his actions and directly apologizes to Seth Francois. He also makes claims of distancing himself from Dom in light of the misconduct accusations stating that he's so sorry that he let the viewer down and that it won't happen again. Dobrik did not mention Trisha Paytas' accusation of it being obvious that the alcohol was present and meant the intercourse couldn't be consensual for the young girls. Nor did Dobrik mention the incident between Paytas and Nash in the hotel room. 
All these controversies stacked up, the vlog squad as it was known was officially over with the bigger members either cancelled or cancelling others. The days of David's golden boy demeanor seem to be gone as scandal after scandal rocks the channel while his sponsorships drop like flies. On top of losing over 100,000 subscribers and 66 million views in a single video, YouTube also temporarily suspended Dobrik and Dom from monetizing their videos, citing strict policies that take allegations very seriously. So where are David and his ex-friends now? If you look at his YouTube channel, it seems like almost nothing has changed. David is still uploading vlogging videos with friends, and what's even more shocking is he's still getting millions of views with each post. The only mention of his months of multiple controversies is one 7 minute long video where Dobrik sums up his apologies and vows not to let these incidents happen again. The next video he posts is only 3 months later entitled Surprising My Friends. The reaction to David's attempt at recovering his image is largely mixed. His newest videos have comments that are rife with fans arguing about whether his quick turnaround invalidates his apologies. One Twitter user wrote, quote, I love how not even two months ago people were cancelling David Dobrik and now all of a sudden everyone is so happy he posted again. Overall, fans are upset that Dobrik and his gang of friends have left his audience with little to no acknowledgement of the controversies and sadly relatively gotten off scot-free. His Instagram is filled to the brim with smiling and innocent photos of him traveling now that he has recently obtained his full American citizenship. Having spent some time back at home in Slovakia, David has significantly reduced his time on social media. His last Instagram post was over a month ago as of December 2021, and similarly his Twitter is sparsely updated. It seems that while Dobrik is still profiting off of his YouTube channel, his step back from social media suggests his career may never return to what it once was. And so it seems David has largely recovered from his downfall, momentarily stunned, yet relatively unscathed. Are you venturing into the fashion industry and is uh, him, him, him going to be of use? Am I venturing into the fashion industry? <laughs> Did you see this cup? <laughs> Kanye West, now legally known as Ye, is a rapper, record producer, and fashion designer who has always been in the limelight for his wild and controversial opinions. We've seen him try to steal awards and give them to others. He's also made some serious accusations towards former President Bush and even Harriet Tubman. Known for his series of public mental breakdowns, Ye is open about his struggles with bipolar disorder. As a big dreamer with huge ambitions, Kanye even ran for president, though that all went down the drain after a very controversial campaign speech. Kim Kardashian is now filing for divorce and joint custody of their four children. His ongoing feuds with other artists and the media has become Ye's entire reality. And it seems at this point, he's too far gone to come back down to earth. Ye's first album, College Dropout, was released in 2004, not shortly after he had dropped out of college to pursue his career in music. Ye has over 160 million records sold has won 22 Grammy Awards, and was listed in Rolling Stone magazine under 100 Greatest Songwriters of All Time. Even Time magazine named him one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Twice. In the early 2000s, Ye was a producer for Rockefeller Records, and he even founded his own record label, Good Music. Kanye has also won a Grammy for Best Contemporary Christian Music Album. Before his mother passed, she and Ye founded the Kanye West Foundation in Chicago in 2003. Their mission was to lower dropout and illiteracy rates, while working with the community to provide music education for underprivileged youth. In 2015, Kanye joined forces with Adidas to create his own fashion line Yeezy. Even though Ye has managed to gain such a massive and dedicated following, his fans started slipping through the cracks as his mental health struggles became more prevalent and extremely concerning for not only himself, but even for those around him. Back in 2009 at the MTV Video Music Awards, we all watched as Taylor Swift had just won the award for Best Video by a Female Artist. And then we all watched Kanye storm up on stage to interrupt Taylor with his infamous line and I quote, I'ma let you finish, but Beyonce had one of the best videos of all time. Taylor girl, you were not the only one with your jaw dropped to the floor. No one could believe what had just happened. But that was just the start of Kanye's crazed persona. During a live fundraiser for the victims of Hurricane Katrina, Kanye decided to go off script and add his own opinion that, and I quote, George Bush doesn't care about black people. His co-presenter Mike Myers had absolutely no idea what had just happened and attempted to continue the broadcast. 
Bush stated in an interview that the comment, and I quote, was one of the most disgusting moments during his presidency. In 2016, Ye even tweeted that he believed Bill Cosby was innocent. He received a huge backlash from media and pretty much the entire Twitter sphere. Patton Oswald even responded with a tweet saying, and I quote, there are easier ways to trend, Kanye. Ye's even posted on Twitter that he was $53 million in debt and asked Mark Zuckerberg to invest $1 billion in his creative ventures. Last time I checked, Mark Zuckerberg was the creator of Facebook and not his corporate competitor, Twitter. I would have suggested a Facebook post at this point, but I think we were totally over what Ye had to say. In 2016, Kanye was on the St. Pablo tour for his seventh album. Several shows on the tour had been canceled due to his lack of sleep and unwell state. The show ended abruptly after Ye went on a 25 minute long rant targeting Facebook, Jay-Z, and Hillary Clinton. He claimed that he would have voted for Trump and called out Mark Zuckerberg for not supporting him financially. Ye even went on to call out Jay-Z as they were supposedly BFS and Jay didn't send any condolences to the Kardashian Wests after the robbery in Paris. Ye continued by sending a public message to Jay-Z claiming that Jay had employed a hitman who could be sent after him. He finally ended his rant with, and I quote, I've been sent here to give y'all my truth, even at the risk of my own life, even at the risk of my own success, my own career. As well, he did have a big finish with, and I quote, get ready to have a field day press because the show's over. He said as he dropped the mic and walked out. Ye was later committed to UCLA Medical Center for hallucinations and paranoia. Since then, an article with Ye determined that he was addicted to opioids prescribed to him after liposuction surgery that may have contributed to this specific nervous breakdown. In 2010, Ye announced, of course on Twitter, that he would be running in the presidential elections, running as an independent under the birthday party. In an interview with Forbes, he explained that the reasoning behind the name was, and I quote, because when we win, it's everybody's birthday. During a debate, he actually had the audacity to suggest that slavery was a choice and that Harriet Tubman did not free slaves. Ye literally said, and I quote, Harriet Tubman never actually freed the slaves. She just had the slaves go work for other white people. How ignorant can one person be? Ye even said during his speech, and I quote, the only thing that can free us is by obeying the rules that we were given for us as a promised land. And this is all coming from the same guy who referred to his spouse's mom as Chris Jong-un. Kim and Kanye met in the early 2000s, and for the longest time, Kim was the only person that Ye followed on Twitter. They began dating in 2012, and West even referred to themselves as walking performance art. In 2013, Kim gave birth to baby Northwest before they tied the knot. Yet, Ye's emotional outbursts and uncalled Twitter rants kept appearing. During another rant, Ye was so emotional over announcing that he and Kim had considered not having baby North when they found out that they were pregnant. Kim has tried to defend Ye's mental health struggles before by stating, and I quote, People are unaware or far removed from this experience can be judgmental and not understand that the individuals themselves have to engage in the process of getting help no matter how hard the family tries. Multiple sources said that Kim was ready to call it quits after Ye's series of outbursts, but still feels compelled to be there for him however she can. Kim has gone on to say that she believes he is smart and talented, but can struggle with isolation and pressure that is heightened by his disorder. Ye has been very open about being bipolar and is, in his own way, attempting to advocate for others, I guess. Kim has stated, and I quote, I kindly ask the media and public give us the compassion and empathy that is needed so that we can get through this. So as of right now, it seems like Ye will be spending a lot of time working on himself and hopefully educating himself on what it means to live with his mental health disorder. He has referred to it as his superpower, but evidence shows it's more like his kryptonite. Kanye is also pouring himself into his work, which we saw in his most recent release, Donda, which is an emotional album about his late mother, Donda West. And Kim Ye is currently seeking joint custody of their four children, and both parties are highly committed to co-parenting. 
It seems like the former couple is on good terms, as Kim showed up to multiple of his Donda listing parties and brought their kids along to support their dad. They will be selling their family home that Ye designed, which Kim paid $20 million to buy outright. Kanye has been publicly distraught about the divorce. However, it seems as though he's moving on. He was out seen with Irina Shayk months after divorce from Kim, although they have split since. This is not the end of Ye though. He's legally changed his name as if he wants a fresh start on life. But only time will tell. And of course, we'll all have to keep our eyes glued to the Twitter feed to see what he has to say. There's, there's, there's many reasons why I, I dislike Zayn and there's many reasons why I'll always, always be on his side. Why Liam Payne decided that 2022, years after One Direction broke up, was a good time to air the dirty laundry everyone else in the band has been relatively low key about, I'll never know. But he did just that when he slammed his former bandmates while on Logan Paul's podcast, Impulsive. Liam Payne became internationally famous at only 14 years old, and now that he's had a child at only 23 years old, and allegedly cheated on his romantic partner, the internet is basically lit on fire slamming Liam for being extra despite having so much else he should be focusing on. Today we're covering Liam Payne. Tomorrow though, you decide. Let us know in the comments down below who you think we should cover on the next episodes of Where Are They Now. While you're down there, don't forget to like this video so we know you enjoy it and can keep making more just like it. Now let's get into it. Liam Payne was born three weeks early and because of that, he got seriously ill very frequently in his early life. Until he was four years old, he had to regularly go to the hospital due to kidney issues. At its worst, he got 16 injections in his arm in the morning and 16 injections in the evening. When he was a student, he also thought that he was going to be a professional sports star. For three years, he ranked in the top three 1500 meter runners in the country within his age group. He also took up boxing lessons at 12 years old before moving on to study music technology at a college. He was, however, born to perform when at only 12 years old, he entered into theater production companies. When Liam was only 14 years old, he made the decision that would go on to change his life by auditioning for the fifth season of The X Factor in front of the notoriously harsh critic, Simon Cowell. He moved on from the first round, but was subsequently cut at the boot camp stage. Then miraculously, Simon changed his mind and decided to ask Liam to return for the judges house stage. He was cut again, but Cowell encouraged Liam to come back in two years. And come back he did. Now 16 years old, he sang Cry Me A River and received a standing ovation from Simon. He once again failed in the judge's house, but upon the suggestion of a guest judge, Simon put Liam with other boys named Harry Styles, Niall Horan, Louis Tomlinson, and Zayn Malik. They began qualifying in the group's category and came in third place on the show. Following the X Factor, the group were dubbed One Direction and signed to Cowell's Entertainment Company. Their debut single, What Makes You Beautiful, instantly became an international success, and from there, One Direction became one of the biggest boy bands from 2011 to 2015. They had a picture-perfect image and were widely loved by their young female audience. But after the release of the group's fifth album called Made in the AM, they decided to go on an indefinite hiatus. When asked why they decided to cease One Direction, Harry Styles said in a 2017 interview that they quote, didn't want to exhaust the fan base. We all thought too much of the group to let that happen. I love the band and would never rule anything out in the future. The band changed my life, gave me everything. Although Harry hinted at the idea of a reunion, it seems now like things were much darker behind the scenes. After they broke up, the entire band basically only spoke well of each other. There didn't really seem to be any animosity. The individuals in One Direction then went on to have moderately successful solo careers, except for Harry Styles, who actually way blew up and continues to make, an in and continues to make insane moves. Liam, for his part, pivoted to more dance style tracks rather than sticking to the formula he and his bandmates had created with One Direction. He released his biggest single, Strip That Down, in 2017. His latest song was a Christmas single featuring the TikTok girl, Charlie D'Amelio. In 2016, a year before One Direction split, when Liam was 24 years old, he and his girlfriend at the time, Cheryl Tweedy, had a son together. They would split a year after their son was born, more on that later. In 2019, Liam also started dating a model named Maya Henry, and they announced their engagement in 2020 before ending it, ending it in 2021. Then the couple got back together later that year, got engaged again, and then split for the second time in May 2022. And you'd think that Liam would kind of just do his own thing. 
but that was until he decided to become a guest on Logan Paul's podcast called Impulsive. While he was there, he basically exposed the entire dirty underbelly of One Direction as well as his own personal life. He admitted to having an alcohol issue while throwing back a few fingers of whiskey, so it could very well be that he wouldn't normally have revealed as much as he did, but he may have spilled the beans due to intoxication. He revealed that, despite being best friends now, he absolutely detested Louis Tomlinson. Quote, I wasn't used to rowdy guys or whatever else. Louis was wild and he wanted to be wild, that's his spirit. And also, he's my best mate now, but in the band, we hated each other. Like, to come to blows hated each other. He also credited himself with being the glue of One Direction, leading the group from the stage and making sure that everyone's doing choreography moves properly. Liam also touched on his beef with Zayn Malik. When Logan brought up a 2020 beef between Jake Paul and Zayn, with Gigi chiming in, Liam stated, quote, she tweeted something about getting yourself a respectful man or something. That one didn't age very well. Everyone figured that was in reference to the alleged violent altercation between Zayn and Gigi's mother, Yolanda. He also said that there were many reasons why he dislikes his former bandmate, that the two never got along. It seemed like there was tons of infighting between the band members. He also spoke of a moment where they fought, quote, there was one time where there was an argument backstage and one member in particular threw me up a wall. So I said to him, if you don't remove those hands, there's a huge likelihood you'll never use them again. While he didn't mention the particular band member by name, the singer hinted earlier in the episode that he and Louis had a tense relationship for a long time, so hopefully it was him, I don't know. He also spoke about what it was like being a father at such a young age. His son's name is Bear, and Liam spoke about how one of his favorite things is taking his son to school. Quote, it's so much fun and I know he loves it too. It happens, you know, once a week or twice a week. I love taking care of him and watching him grow. Hopefully he does a little bit better than I did. I'll get into what fans thought about it much later, but a bunch of people took this as Liam not spending enough time with his son as he should. Liam also mentioned not being able to see his kid a lot because of being an artist and how grateful he is for his ex taking over basically the entire parenting role. To add even more drama to the fire too, Liam is having some serious girl trouble. While I have spoken before about him dating the model Maya Henry and they got engaged twice, as it is now they are broken up. Liam reportedly also had a fling with a model named Aliana Mala before now, but it's kind of messy as to whether that's still going on or not. According to the Daily Mail, it was previously revealed that Liam Payne and Aliana Mala had unfollowed each other on Instagram, seeming to suggest that their romance was over. But it is unclear whether the singer had called it quits with the influencer, as insiders told Mail Online that Aliana is under the impression that the pair is still going strong, while Maya believes the romance is over. Speaking to Mail Online, one source claimed the pair are still together but keeping it low key, while another simply described the romance as a drunken 48 hour fling. Some people, however, think that Liam cheated on Maya as his ex fiance addresses photos of Liam with another woman at the bar. She said on Twitter, quote, Please stop sending me these pictures of my fiance wrapped around another woman. This is not me, and it's hard enough knowing this has happened without seeing it. Enough now. As for One Direction fans, well, let's say they are seriously not happy with Liam for being so forthcoming about the issues with One Direction. A lot of fans were super upset about Liam's dig at Zayn over the Yolanda thing. One Twitter user wrote, quote, Liam talking about Zayn as if he didn't cheat on his fiance last week. Another said, quote, If Liam Payne talking about Zayn on the Logan Paul podcast isn't an indicator of how irrelevant his career is, then I don't know what is. While a third wrote, quote, Zayn choosing to keep certain aspects of his life private and Liam airing it out voluntarily to Logan Paul is a prime example of how wicked this man truly is. One Direction fans were also outraged over Payne claiming his 2017 debut solo single, Strip That Down, outsold everyone within the band. They shared screenshots showing that songs such as Harry Styles' Grammy winning Watermelon Sugar and Malik's Don't Wanna Live Forever have surpassed Strip That Down with over a billion streams each and reminded Payne that his critically panned 2019 album, LP1, peaked at number 111 on the Billboard 200. One fan even wrote, quote, nobody, I mean nobody has ever said put on that new Liam Payne song. So this is what happens when you Instagram on slightly uh, tipsy. Things just seem like a really good idea. Army Hammer was, at one point, a classically handsome movie star who made triple A films that led him to fame beyond his famous dynasty of a family. But all of that changed when he was slammed hard with allegations of physical harm against his partners and the impulse to want to eat other people. 
He got slammed with allegations of being obsessed with non-consensual intimacy. Since then, he has retreated from the public eye and the Los Angeles Police Department has an active investigation against him. As he just left rehab recently, a documentary has been announced that is set to expose not only him, but his entire family as well for their crimes that have gone completely unchecked for so long. Today we're covering Army Hammer. Tomorrow though, you decide. Let us know in the comments down below who you think we should cover on the next episodes of Where Are They Now? While you're down there, be sure to like this video if you enjoyed it so we know to keep making more just like it. Now, let's get into it. Army Hammer was born into the dynasty that was his father's several businesses, including Nodler Publishing and Armand Hammer Productions. His grandfather was an oil tycoon, and they had been extremely high class for generations before that. Army himself grew up in Texas before his family moved around a bit and then settled in Los Angeles. He dropped out of high school though in the 11th grade to fully pursue an acting career. His parents, for their part, decided to disown him when he left school and they admonished his decision to become a full time actor, but they have since come around to being supportive and proud of his work. Hammer began acting with small guest appearances in Arrested Development, Veronica Mars, Gossip Girl, and Desperate Housewives. His first venture into film came with a minor role in a horse movie called Flicka. His first leading role came with his portrayal of a Christian evangelicist named Billy Graham in the movie Billy The Early Years. In 2007, Army Hammer was hand selected by George Miller to star in the planned superhero movie called Justice League Mortal. He was going to star as Batman before the film eventually got cancelled. The film's cancellation happened in large part due to the looming 2008 Writers Guild of America strike. It wasn't until 2010, however, that ARMY received his first breakout role in the movie The Social Network about the creation of Facebook. He portrayed the identical twins Cameron and Tyler Winklevoss. This movie earned ARMY his first critical success where Time Magazine remarked that his portrayal of the twins was, quote, astonishing. He also won the Toronto Film Critics Association Award for Best Supporting Actor. In 2013, he was cast beside Johnny Depp in the Disney movie The Lone Ranger. In 2017, Army filmed perhaps his most known role as Oliver in the Sony Pictures movie called Call Me By Your Name, opposite Timothy Chalamet. For his stellar performance, he received the Critics' Choice Award, Independent Spirit Award, and a Golden Globe. As for his personal life, well, that's where things start to get a little rocky. In May 2010, Army married a television personality named Elizabeth Chambers. She is a cooking show on the Food Network and works for Today. The pair were first introduced by Army's friend and eventually went on to have two children together. But after 10 years of marriage in 2020, Army and Elizabeth announced their separation via Instagram. This announcement was about seven months before all hell broke loose for Army. Apparently, the reason behind this divorce was past infidelity on Army's part, but also when they were all staying home in late 2020, the actor decided that he couldn't stand it any longer and just kind of abandoned the family where they were staying in the Cayman Islands. It became the last straw for Elizabeth. By January 1st, 2021, Army became involved in several short-term flings. At one point, he had tweeted, quote, 2021 is going to kneel down before me and kiss my feet because this year I'm the boss. Several weeks later, however, Army found himself in a very dark crisis. Amid the turmoil of divorce proceedings, several women took to social media to accuse the actor of emotional harm, manipulation, and violence. The scandal ballooned as screen grabs circulated that seemed to show the actor describing explicit fantasies involving non-consensual intimacy and cannibalism. It happened after two of his victims created an Instagram account to share all of the gruesome details of what ARMY wanted to do to them. They also shared photos of bruises and bite marks they had sustained from the actor. One of the unnamed people behind the account says that she had an affair with Hammer for four years, and that she found five other women who all say that they were involved with the actor. The account creator says she and Hammer had been talking since 2016 while he was still married to Elizabeth Chambers. Many other women then started to come forward with their own claims about dealing with the actor and in some conversations that were shared, he reportedly tells them he wants to quote, bite pieces off of them and told one woman he wanted to eat her heart. Since the DM scandal broke, Hammer stepped away from the upcoming rom-com Shotgun Wedding, which he was set to star in alongside Jennifer Lopez. He released a statement addressing the reason why he was no longer working on the film. Quote, I'm not responding to these claims, but in light of the vicious and spurious online attacks against me, I cannot in good conscience now leave my children for four months to shoot a film in the Dominican Republic. Lionsgate is supporting me in this and I'm grateful to them for that. A representative with Lionsgate said, quote, he has requested to step away from the film and we support him in this decision, which is kind of a non way of saying we support you in quitting. <laughs> but then the cops got involved. The Grand Cayman police spoke to the actor about inappropriate footage that had been circulating of a woman on his private Instagram account where 
he shows her naked in bed while he complains about his ex-wife and having to see his kids. The Royal Cayman Island Police Service took to Twitter on January 20th to share a news update. Quote, on January 15th, 2021, the RCIPS received an allegation of misuse of ICT in relation to a suggestive video which has been posted on social media. Officers investigated the matter and spoke to the suspect who has been warned about his conduct in accordance with the wishes of the compliant. The matter is now closed. It has, however, been revealed that the case isn't fully closed. While in the Cayman Islands they had finished their investigation, the Los Angeles Police Department has not. They have an active file currently open pertaining to non-consensual intimacy and violence against the actor and the whole thing is currently still ongoing. One woman in particular is at the front of it all named Effie. Although she is kept anonymous for her own safety, she's pursuing Army Hammer for what he allegedly did to her. His attorney, however, continues to outright deny any wrongdoing. Quote, from day one, Mr. Hammer has maintained that all of his interactions with Effie and every other partner of his for that matter has been completely consensual, discussed and agreed upon in advance and mutually participatory. In the months after the scandal, Army fell into substance use and became entirely dependent on alcohol, physical intimacy and other harder substances. It got to the point where he had to admit himself into a rehabilitative service. And now it brings us to the last we've seen of Army Hammer as he left rehab in February of this year. After two months in the facility, Army left and moved back to the Cayman Islands to stay with his ex wife and children where he claims to be working on his sobriety and staying admitted to it. Quote, Army is very committed to his sobriety and has been super consistent with it. His main priority is staying sober and being there for his kids and Elizabeth. But don't take that to mean he and his ex are reconciling. Quote, they're not back together, but they're co-parenting. He's really just trying to be there for his kids. He has a solid support system with his friends and Elizabeth has also been very supportive along the way. As of right now, he's not working on any movies, obviously, since the allegations came forward. Although an old movie of his was released in 2021 that was filmed back in 2019. And now now, a documentary special about Army Hammer and the rest of his crime ridden family is in the works. ID and Discovery Plus have a documentary special lined up that details Hammer's controversy and that it is something that runs in the family. Variety reported that House of Hammer, the working title for the doc, looks at different scandals that plague five generations of the Hammer family. Army's the scion of the Hammer dynasty, with deep ties to businesses and foundations in New York and Los Angeles. His grandfather, oil tycoon Armand Hammer, ran Occidental Petroleum and had close relations with Russia, the Middle East, and the British royal family. So there's a bevy of arenas this documentary could potentially explore. So far, there's no release date, but we'll definitely keep our eyes peeled. Hello, Ned's wife. <laughs> in case you haven't been in the loop with the internet lately, there's a popular YouTuber named Ned Fulmer who was once a part of the four-piece comedian entertainment channel, The Try Guys. However, most recently, Ned's been dropped from his career because of his spicy cheating scandal. I'm your host, Michaela. Let's jump right in. American comedy group The Try Guys consists of current members Keith Douglas Hasperberger, Eugene Lee Yang, and Zachary Andrew Zach Kornfeld, and once also included former member Edward Gallo Ned Fulmer prior to his departure earlier this month. The quartet first found fame through their unusual videos before they started their YouTube channel on May 22nd, 2018. Before this, the Try Guys uploaded videos under the network BuzzFeed's motion pictures in 2014. The first member of the former quartet turned trio I will be introducing is Keith. Keith was born in Carthage, Tennessee to parents Donald and Patricia Hasperberger. Keith is the youngest of three brothers and graduated from Illinois State University with a bachelor's degree in acting and French horn. He has a wife named Rebecca Becky Hasperberger. Outside of his Try Guy antics, Keith is also a member of the comedy group Lou Burger, alongside Huey Stonefish and Alex Lewis. The group has made appearances on numerous TV talent shows like Bring the Funny in 2018 and most recently America's Got Talent in 2021. His love for fried chicken is very well known as he typically released a bunch of food related content throughout his years of content creation. The most popular shows of Keith's are Eat the Menu, Gourmet Garbage, and Chicken Watch. Keith is additionally the visionary behind the Without a Recipe Try Guys series. Back in November 2019, Keith dropped the announcement of his hot sauce, Keith's Chicken Sauce, which ended up selling out in two days with a wide reception from consumers. Currently, Keith owns two burger and taco sauce lines with availability through Heatonist. Next up, we have Zach. Zach was born to Jewish parents Adam and Margot Kornfeld in Scarsdale, New York on July 26, 1990. Zach was heavily involved in filmmaking and editing once he received the Lego Movie Maker as a kid after he got the attention of a young Steven Spielberg, who once told Zach that he has moxie. Zach's religion is Jewish, but he did not receive a bar mitzvah, nor does he keep kosher. However, he did decide to select the Hebrew
computer name Rakdan, which means dancer. Zach was previously diagnosed with AQ losing spondinitis in his late 20s. He graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Emerson College. When he was a kid, Zach made a Saturday Night Live appearance in a Elijah Wood hosted episode, which aired on December 13th, 2003. In that same month in 2018, Zach released an announcement that he was in a relationship with a pediatric nurse named Margaret Angela Maggie Bustamante, who later announced their engagement in August 2020. In 2019, Zach made the decision to undergo a hair restoration treatment, which was a blend of surgery and microblading to counter the effects of male pattern alpecia. The announcement of Zach's desire to begin a six part series on the Try Guys' YouTube channel came about on May 13th, 2020, which was a challenge to open up his own business, Zotico T Co., with a budget under $500. The final current member of Try Guys is Eugene. Eugene was born in Texas to parents Jay Young and Min Young Lee, who originated in South Korea. His birth date is January 18th, 1986, and he has two sisters named Whitney and Christy. Eugene is a University of Southern California graduate with a bachelor's in cinema production. He's a regular participant in LGBTQ plus pride events and has even worked alongside the Trevor Project. Eugene officially came out as gay on June 15, 2019 in a YouTube video titled I'm Gay. He also made an announcement that same year that he was in a committed relationship with longtime partner Matthew McLean. Eugene has formally walked on the 2021 Met Gala red carpet and is the first and only Try Guy to attend the Affluent event. Now what would be a Ned Falmer centric video without the introduction of Ned himself? Ned was conceived on June 11, 1987 in Jacksonville, Florida. He graduated from Yale University as a chemistry major. Ned worked in a chemistry lab for a large portion of his time prior to his career change at BuzzFeed. He also previously resided in Chicago where he worked at a renewable energy lab in the days and then performed improv and sketches for IO Chicago's second city house teams during nights. Through this, Ned was named a critic's pick by Time Out Chicago. Ned has stated that he is of Italian ancestry. His wife is an interior designer named Ariel Fulmer and the couple shares two children together. Their oldest son's name is Wesley James Fulmer and their youngest is Finley Fulmer. The Verge made note of the fact that a lot of Ned's public persona revolved around being a husband and that he has also successfully built a fan base and brand around this relationship specifically. However, then came the September 27th announcement from Try Guys that Ned would no longer be associated with the working group in light of an internal review that revealed he had an extramarital affair with a fellow employee. This followed the published photos of Ned and the worker locking lips at a Harry Styles concert. The Try Guys were formed in 2014 by Keith, Ned, Zach, and Eugene and contained uploaded content of all their BuzzFeed Network videos prior, as well as their YouTube channel, which published their first video, Guys Try Ladies Underwear, for the first time on September 12, 2014. Their leave from BuzzFeed was announced on June 16, 2018, and they later started up their own independent production company under the name Second Try LLC. Second Try was given all rights to the Try Guys brand despite the fact that BuzzFeed will continue to be the sales representative for Second Try's brand content and advertising sales. Additionally, the group hosted the 8th Streamy Awards, which was live broadcast and on YouTube. December 26, 2018 saw the Try Guys posting a video which broke down what their life was prior to starting their group, and in that same month in 2019, the group explained that they decided to quit BuzzFeed because their contracts were expiring. This brought forth Zach's and Ned's contribution to the idea of developing Second Try to fruition when they discussed their future. Since the Try Guys have kept with their highly successful YouTube channel and their beloved podcast, The Tripod. The group released a book called The Hidden Power of Effing Up and embarked on a worldwide tour as well. In 2021, the Try Guys signed a Food Network deal to produce a spin off TV show for one of their series without a recipe. The show, titled No Recipe Road Trip, broadcasts on FN and Discovery Plus' streaming services with a recent premiere date of August 31st, 2022. Their Squad Wars show on YouTube Red premiered in early 2017. The Try Guys' highest traction video is the Try Guys Try Labor Pain Simulation, which is reportedly garnered over 35 million views by March 2021. In their time, the group has amassed over 100 million views from their BuzzFeed videos on the network's YouTube channel. On their own channel, the Try Guys have accumulated over 1.6 billion views with 7.5 million subscribers in total. TTG was further nominated for the Streamy Awards' Audience Choice Show of the Year Award in 2017. The following year, Try Guys hosted their 8th annual award show and won the exact same accolade they were previously nominated for the year before. Aside from this, Try Guys have additionally received various media attention. Filming for these videos usually occur in LA and Glendale and Burbank, however, depending on the type of video being filmed, they may take place elsewhere. July 14, 2021 saw the Try Guys star in the YouTube original series, Hot to Olympics, in collaborations with the Olympic YouTube channel. This was produced in lineup with their 2020 summer event in Tokyo, Japan, being held a month after the group's appearance. Most recently, as of September 27th of this year, the remaining Try Guys members severed ties with Ned after he admitted to a consensual workplace relationship. Their decision fell in line with the cheating rumors that were virally encircling social media the same day he and group executive Alexandra Alex Herring were reportedly together. If you're enjoying today's WATN, help us out by liking today's video. Now, let's discuss Ned's cheating scandal and how it relates to what we currently know. The Try Guys were able to successfully launch their own YouTube channel through their widely popular videos where they focused on trying new things and filming them. As I'm sure
sure most have expected given their name. However, fans and viewers have been completely transfixed because of the massive fidelity rumors surrounding former Try Guy member Ned, who has since been getting compared to the likes of John Mulaney. A since deleted subreddit post under the Try Guys account arose on Monday night and was later repurposed in a viral Twitter thread from the account Ned Fulmer Exposed. The blend of these two sources alleged that Ned had cheated on Ariel with a group associate producer. Ariel has started numerous Try Guy videos over the years and is well known within their fan base. The evidence to back up these claims were posted on Reddit, which displayed a blurry video of someone who has since been connected to Ned making out with the producer, who has since been identified as Alex. Combine that with the reported DMs from Alex's fiance, Ned's lack of appearances in a handful of recent Try Guy videos, including their introduction to the group episodes, and his missing presence from Tripod, well, you get a mess. The heap of circumstantial evidence also depicts analyzing which parts of the parties and followed the others, and Ariel removed the term Ned's wife from her Instagram profile. All this led up to Try Guys' social media announcement that Ned is no longer working with them following their internal review conduction, thanking supporters for sticking by them as they weather through this brooming store. Ned has since limited the amount of people who can comment on his post, while Ariel has removed the ability to comment from her page entirely. In that statement, he shared, quote, Family should have been my priority, but I lost focus and had a consensual workplace relationship. I'm sorry for any pain my actions may have caused to the guys and the fans, but most of all, Ariel. The only thing that matters right now is my marriage and my children, and that's where I'm going to focus my attention. Ariel uploaded her own statement to social media with, Nothing is more important to me than Ned and our family, and all we request right now is that you respect our privacy for the sake of our kids. Naturally, the news has floored Try Guy fans, especially because a large part of Ned's online persona is him being a total wife guy, constantly praising Ariel and mentioning her in loads of videos. People who have maintained a supporter of Ned for nearly a decade now feel betrayed by the infidelity that has taken place. In the term of his John Mulaney connection, the unfaithful man who made his ex-wife a large portion of his stand-up routines and then cheated on her, his situation has been said to be much closer to John's than someone like Adam Levine. Of course, memes about Ned followed with some even hitting below the belt to express their disappointment. However, the other aspect regarding the confirmed rumors gutted people as much as they joked about it. Some fans have even tried placing themselves in the remaining Try Guys' shoes to imagine their reaction, while others are heavily invested in the idea that Ned has recently been chopped and excluded from all their recent uploads.